and we'll come back to it in a second, I first want to probe you without putting you on the spot, uh, but probe your um, ideas about what is special about living systems as opposed to non-living systems, physical objects versus biological systems or objects. Do you have any ideas? What is the most fundamental difference between, between physical and biological matter? Any volunteers? Perhaps the way we extreme energy? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, you're almost uh, right on the mark. A bit more specifically. So, what, 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 what maybe you can elaborate on this? How do, yeah? Pretty much, pretty much it. Yes, yes, exactly. Bang on. <laughs> in, in, in different co contexts, I had lengthy conversations about this. Uh, I actually gave a similar talk in Luxembourg in November to a group of graduate students there, and and I think we spent half an hour listing things, my, writing on the whiteboard, and eventually leading on it. And, and then they discovered the what Erwin Schrödinger wrote about is in this in this book, What Is Life that biological systems work towards not only against the second law of thermodynamics, but actively to reduce entropy, entropy reduction, which physical systems never do on their own. They, they always increase entropy, yeah. okay? So, um, but to reduce entropy, which means bring order or self-organization that's what biological systems, they have to be organized, self-organized. Nobody is doing this. We don't have little machines making cells. <laughs> cells are born, they grow, they divide, etc., etc. but they don't need anybody's help except to be provided with nutrients and maybe ambient conditions, you know, temperature, pressure, stuff like that. But mainly provided nutrients to build, rebuild, repair and perform functions. And everything else follows. This is the most fundamental aspect of biological systems. So entropy reduction, we'll come back to it. And the question is, okay, how does it happen? You know, there's a lot of interesting aspects of it, the ma machinery of life, motor proteins, cytoskeleton, how all of this self-organizes. And, and you need to provide energy to maintain it. Otherwise, it'll degrade and of course, even if you do, it happens anyway, because we all age. And from, let's say, the age of 25, I think is peak performance physically, physiological performance, probably around the time, your age, I would guess, yeah, around 25. I'm not going to probe you about age. But then from twi the age of 25 on, every year you lose about 1% of some function. Sad, but true. Okay. So that's, that's the framework within which we will discuss biology. And now the, back to physics. For, 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 so I was telling you about the evolution of physics from mechanics to optics to uh, electromagnetism, um, Maxwell, so Newton, mechanics and optics, Maxwell electromagnetism, then electromagnetism be became, um, sorry, uh, We'll come back to it. Became elect electrodynamics, but um, led to almost everything that we know and and love, right? Everything that we know and love is based on electromagnetism, the theory of electromagnetism, and later on electronics and thermodynamics, which culminated in the building of steam engines, uh, machines. Uh, internal combustion engines, diesel, our cars, etc. Et uh, and what happened is at the end of 19th century, so to, I don't remember exactly the 1878 or something like this, th there was a very deeply seated conviction that there's nothing to be discovered in physics, that physics was finished, everything else would be applications of physics to um, engineering, let's say, to making better structures, buildings, machines, etc. 
And, and then suddenly something pesky occurred and physicists couldn't solve these things. Um, and, and that was the seed from which quantum mechanics was born. And I think I'm talking about this in the historical perspective because I believe that biology is currently in a very similar predicament that it seems like we know, you know everything is genes and, and, and proteomes and then we go um, metabolomics and add things but really nothing major is happening except more data. But maybe that's a fallacy which is similar to the fallacy of of uh, physics being done by the end of 19th century, which was um, articulated by Lord Kelvin in a Royal Society address where he, he actually said it, that, that physics is finished and the rest is application. And then a mere two decades later, there was this one of the greatest revolutions in science, if not the greatest, you know, we talk about revolutions in science occurring maybe every century or so. I think now we are going through the revolution in biology, which we don't know where it will take us, but physics went through this about a century ago, um, and that included two, two areas of physics which came out of nowhere, and that was quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity, Einstein's special and general theory of relativity, and then extensions of these things. So I show, I, I show this photo here for you because it's a historical picture from uh, a series of Solvay conferences, Solvay because Solvay was a chemical company in Belgium that sponsored these conferences and they took place in Hotel Metropole in Brussels, which I visited. I like going to historical places that have a meaning in the context of physics. This is one of those important places where basically it's almost like a convention where people try to find a consensus uh, on a field that was emerging. And, and you can barely s see the faces, but almost half of these people had uh, uh, received Nobel Prizes. Uh, you see uh, Albert Einstein in the middle, Marie Curie, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, Max Planck, uh, Dirac, Niels Bohr on the right, and, and many others. Um, as I said, almost uh, at least half of them, maybe more, uh, were Nobel Prize winners and major Nobel, Nobel Prizes. I don't want to put it down, but, but uh, yeah, Nobel Prize is a big thing, of course, right? But these days, uh, people forget uh, who got Nobel Prize last year. Uh, I, I don't want to challenge you, but I, I do forget. <laughs> I remember this year, 2017, in medicine physiology, because I, I was privileged to meet with one of the Nobel Prize winners in medicine just a few days ago in San Diego. Um, um, but, this is for molecular clocks, by the way, which is also very interesting and, and has some connection to, to these lectures I'm going to give. S synchronization of biological function and, and um, the molecular um, entrainment of, of enzymes and, and hormones into, into a well-functioning organism. Okay, so... <coughs> It took about less than three decades to, to formulate, formulate quantum mechanics properly. And uh, just to give you, we'll go through the basics in a second, but uh, I'm still on slide one. And, and I don't want to go into the nitty gritty because it'll be a bit uh, heavy. Uh, but I want to give you phases of quantum mechanics uh, uh, development over the intervening decades. And by the way, we're not done yet. Uh, th there are still disputes about interpretation of quantum mechanics going on today. Um, but the first phase was um, uh, empirical and it was called wave mechanics. Then it changed into quantum mechanics. And there are three phases of quantum mechanics called first quantization, second quantization and third quantization. Um, and, and I'll tell you when we go through the postulates what, what that, these terms mean. So three phases of development and then after that actually quantum mechanics itself became somewhat obsolete because it was replaced with something called quantum field theory. Quantum field theory which is currently the, the dominant um, formulation of quantum principles, quantum field theory. So uh, 
if, if you will, thinking about physical objects, you think typically about billiard balls, hard spheres, hitting, colliding, scattering, this kind of thing, right? So initially, this is how physicists thought about elementary particles. Elementary particles are electrons, protons, neutrons, and subatomic particles. And imagining, imagining these as, as um, spherical objects with some mass and moving at some speed, we'll, we'll revise all of these concepts which come from intuition. Um, but quantum field theory doesn't even talk about that. There is no such thing as a, as a massive particle. It is a wave, a, a field actually. Field meaning spatially and temporally distributed uh, uh, mathematical function actually. There's a complete abstraction. Um, okay, uh, that's the way we, 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 we think these days about um, the foundations of physics. Physics, But let's go back to 1927 and the, the, after um, these five experiments, I, and we'll, we'll see which experiments were so pesky, were eventually explained by quantum mechanics. Uh, these people here gathered to try and uh, wrap their heads around it and put together a formalism or elegant form mathematical formulation of what physics should look like. It was based actually on, mm, to some degree, on this previous centuries of development. If you took physics, I'm sure you did at some stage, 100 or 124 or something like this here, right? <laughs> you, may, you may remember Newton's laws, but probably you don't know that there was something which is much more elegant than Newton's laws, namely, Hamilton's formulation of mechanics, Hamiltonian mechanics and Lagrangian mechanics, Lagrange, Hamilton. These are mathematicians who made this beautifully elegant, created functions which were supposed to be subject to minimization and, and th these functions led to Newton's equations but uh, in, in a different form. All right, so these guys were very familiar with, with all this math that was uh, luckily uh, available all the mathematics that physics needed in, in the 1927, let's say, had been previously constructed in 19th century by people like, uh, like Hamilton, Jacobi, and Lagrange, Liouville. There was a whole school of um, functional analysis in France and Germany and England. And these people were developing this completely out of pure curiosity and joy and didn't have any clue that eventually this will become the foundation of our understanding of the universe. I think this is one of the most incredible stories that we don't talk about enough. That there is um, science done without any prag pragmatic or practical importance, which is so important later on, and nobody could have predicted this at all. But, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, what it is actually. Okay, so, <coughs> As a result of the, these conferences in Brussels, um, uh, our understanding of the universe changed completely. Um, so as I said, Newton's mechanics talks about <coughs> objects with mass, defined mass, defined position, and defined velocity. Colliding or moving as a result of a force, gravity, inclines, you know all this from high school physics or first year university physics, incredibly boring stuff, but somebody has to do it. <laughs> and, um, and that was actually, when you look at the microscopic world, the, the world of atoms, molecules, subatomic particles, it, it, it's completely bogus. It doesn't, it, nothing like that exists. We you don't have, you we can't think about electrons as ping pong balls or, or nu nuclei as as uh, tennis balls. Um, at the microscopic level, the concept of position and velocity is blurred. Uh, the concept of identity of even particles is blurred. Um, and, and then there is the, the question of um, measurement. This is one of the most important deviations from the past. Uh, actually, it's a philosophically fundamental aspect. 
uh, about the objective existence of the universe. Because, because uh, in quantum mechanics, as opposed to classical mechanics, in classical mechanics you can kind of s separate the, the system and the observer, somebody, we're observing something, let's say you can observe um, a, a plume of smoke or, or a, a drop of ink in a container, just look at it, maybe take pictures and try to analyze the evolution of these things. And you think that you are objective and you are not affecting the system, right? That's when, and in biology it's the same thing. You don't want to, if you, if when you observe animals in the wild, in the ecosystem, you don't want to interfere with their grazing or feeding habits, right? But in quantum mechanics, that is simply not possible. At the level of elementary particle physics, there is no separation between the observer and the observed. That is, any act of observation perturbs the system because even if you use the slightest of influences, for example, a single photon, single ray of light, you will disturb the electron from its position. So there's no ob objective experiment. There's no objective. Now people ask even if there is a universe without the observer. It's, I, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not going to engage in this discussion. I have my opinion, of course, and you can probably guess what it is. <laughs> but, but the question of separation of the observer and the observed is, is a real one in quantum mechanics because we can never really get to the bottom of objective reality without changing it, right? And one more thing, we'll, we'll come to it. Um, at the end of 19th century, there was also a very uh, strongly uh, ingrained uh, uh, point of view due to Laplace that, that the, the universe is know knowable. In other words, and, and Laplace said, give me the initial conditions of all the particles in the universe, I'll predict the future. Based on classical mechanics, in principle, it's just a question of solving second order differential equations, however many. And the, the belief was that, that that's it. Quantum mechanics uh, gives a, a, a mortal blow to, to this uh, concept. It simply tells you that even if you want to predict the future of a single particle, not the universe, one particle, we don't know it. You cannot know it. Not, not only that, because we are so technologically backward, and one day we will be able to do it. No, it can never be done. And, and I'll show you why. So, it's, a, it's a, a complete transformation of the view of the universe. It's a complete revolution in our thinking. And even now, people are grappling with this. If quantum so all of this maybe so, so far can sound to you as uh, you know, some kind of abstract uh, discussions about electrons and photons and stuff like that. But, but if there is more to it, if our brain operates or uses quantum mechanics to some degree, perhaps there's much more to it than just elementary particles. It could be the way we operate as human beings that it may be affected by quantum principles and therefore, we can never be uh, replaced, and this is now fashionable, by robots and, and machine learning algorithms. And I do believe in that. Okay, so that, there you go. I'm not a great fan of machine learning, by the way. I, I know it speeds things up and makes life simpler, but I, I cannot really um, be made creative, in my, my opinion. It doesn't actually even teach you anything. Um, so, these are the, the new ideas, and now we're go going into the nitty-gritty of quantum mechanics a little bit without the, the math, which is a little bit hard. Um, the first one, so I'm going to highlight the, the differences between classical, the, the cl classical physics and quantum physics. The first one is that in classical physics, we had a clear distinction between waves and particles. Whoever here took Physics 124, that is the title, Particles and Waves, right? And makes a clear distinction. You have waves 
uh, acoustic waves, you know, uh, electromagnetic waves, uh, sound waves, you know, so, uh, and so and so on. On the one hand, and you have particles on the other hand. Quantum mechanics merges the two. It says that there is no such thing as as waves and particles separately. They are together. One object, any object, at, at the level of quantum mechanics. Of course, the question is where does quantum mechanics end? and classical begin, and nobody knows that. <laughs> but every physical object at this level of description is both a wave and a particle. That it, it all depends on what kind of probe or experiment you're proposing to, um, to use to investigate it. So for example, you may remember from Physics 124, the one single slit and double slit experiment, right? Vaguely, or diffraction draking. And this was designed to, to show diffraction patterns, uh, let's say ocean waves or, or acoustic waves or, or, or light going through this. You will see on the screen the pattern, right? Well, you would think that an electron or a neutron is a particle, therefore, will either go through one, if it's a double slit, one opening or the other, but not through both. both. It turns out, experiments show that particles magically split into two and go, and go simultaneously through two or a, as many openings as the, there are. In other words, particles become waves. And you see, and you see diffraction patterns when you, when you um, shine a beam of, of uh, particles, neutrons or electrons or protons, through diffraction uh, gratings or slit, double slit experiments. There's no difference from this point of view. Conversely, waves, such as light, behave like particles because, for example, if you have an electron sitting um, stationary somewhere and you hit it with a photon, a quantum of light, it will be scattered as if it was, and, and it, it was co it, as if it collided with a massive particle. So, so photons or electromagnetic waves also have, have momentum. Momentum is basically, uh, in classical physics, you may remember, mass times velocity is defined as momentum by Newton. Suddenly light, which has no mass, has momentum. How can you explain it? Well, quantum mechanics does. All right, so wave-particle duality is the first distinction uh, compared to classical physics. The second, somewhat related to it, is that um, instead of uh, introducing positions and momenta or positions and velocities to characterize a system, right? You have uh, conceptually, you, you may think about a bunch of billiard balls, each of which has some position and momentum or position velocity uh, attached to it. In quantum mechanics, there is no such thing as, as a position because every particle has a probability of being everywhere. Let, let this thing sink in. There is no such thing as a position for a, for a particle. The particle has a probability of being at a position, any position. So it's a probability distribution function instead of... That's how you characterize uh, uh, quantum objects by introducing wave functions. Wave functions squared define a probability distribution function. We, do we have a marker? Maybe not. Anybody? I, I, I would like to. No? Okay. If you have a marker, I, I'd like to. Because sometimes. Uh, thanks. Okay, psi. So this is a wave function of, a, of an object. It's a, it's a complex function. It, it's actually mm, x, y, z should be, so it's three coordinates at one time. Right? Let's call it vector. So, and, and square, oh, this is absolute value squared because it's a complex function, is, oh, okay, sorry, <laughs> equals <laughs> maybe another one. <laughs> okay, we're introducing a little bit of entertainment into it, which is great. Great, thank you. So this is the probability distribution, let's say x, y, z, t. It tells you, not that there is a particle here or there, it tells you that there is, the let's say this is your space, 
your particle may be mainly here, uh, but it's possibly everywhere else. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I can draw it any better. But you can kind of see, it, if it was only 1D, you'd see some kind of a bell-shaped distribution. It's, it's hi highest probability it's here. But there's also non-zero probability somewhere else far away. You see how it's different from what we think about in classical mechanics? You have mass and x, y, z, and it's here. Now, it has a velocity v, it's moving in this direction, but now it's everywhere. So you, you can define also an evolution. Of the, so the only thing you can say is that I can predict how this <coughs> probability distribution will evolve in the future. Um, to, to give you a little bit of um, maybe everyday flavor for it, you could think about, uh, let's say, uh, a metaphor for it would be a probability distribution of voters for the Liberal Party of Canada, and you'd say Ontario is largely liberal and Alberta is more conservative so this distribution probably is dying down in the fringes of the country for example right and then you can think about the evolution of the probabilities what can I say about 2019 based on today it's drifting towards more liberal in Ontario less in Alberta for example so that's how you can think about <coughs> wave functions in quantum mechanics probability distribution which are evolving in time and space. Okay, so that's, <coughs> that's the language of, of quantum mechanics. Um, I talked about the observer, and the last thing that is, uh, uh, not the last thing, but the last of the most important changes from classical to quantum is of course quantization. So quantization means graininess and it, it's, it's actually a little bit of a misnomer because it, um, not every quantum system has to be energy quantized but many are so you can think about <coughs> um, an electron trapped in a well this is your electron and of course I'm already making a mistake because I'm <laughs> I'm putting the, it here but it can be somewhere else actually it's a wave function, it can even be outside. Um, so this is hard to imagine, right? Uh, if you think about tennis balls, you, and it's a well, you drop a tennis ball into a well, it'll be sitting at the bottom eventually. Um, but in quantum mechanics, it can also tunnel out of it. Even if it's sitting at the bottom, it can be outside. Uh, it's called the tunneling effect. Bizarre, but I mean, it's not crazy. It's bizarre, but it's true because if not for the tunneling effect, you wouldn't have any semiconductor uh, technology. We wouldn't have silicon based technology. We wouldn't have any computers or cell phones. All of it is based on the tunneling effect. Um, but what I want to say is that <laughs> in, in a situation like this, depends on the, depending on the energy of this electron, it can be sitting at, um, let's say, finite number of energy levels one two three or more and that's the quantization energy quantization so let's say this lowest energy that can have is called epsilon zero the ground state the next one is the first excited state and then there could be a second excited state e0 e1 e2 and so on so forth could have an infinity of excited states but the key is that in almost all quantum situations there is a energy gap gap in other words an electron cannot exist with an energy that which is in between these two that's why it's called quantization quantized it is grain uh, has you know, grainness uh, if you will um, okay so that's quantization and by the way that was determined from uh, the very early experiments the five experiments I told you about one of the very first was the experiment on electron spectra and hydrogen, right? Hydrogen spectra, helium spectra, molecular spectra eventually. And all these electrons 
we're sitting at the predetermined so uh, energy levels. The nucleus was metaphorically represented as the sun. And then electrons in a, in a hydrogen or helium, other atoms, were represented as planets orbiting the sun, right? So this was a kind of heliocentric uh, metaphor for the atomic spectra. <laughs> and if you have electrons here and here, this electron can move from that orbit, it's n equals 1, this is n equals 2, uh, but needs to get energy, a kick of energy. This can be excited by a photon. So if you deliver a precise amount of energy, by a photon or electromagnetic wave, you'll transition that electron from the first orbit to the second orbit. But then, because it's higher, it can be spontaneously sent back to the first orbit. And it, as, it, as it does so, it emits the same photon back. And this is the basis for spectroscopy. You must have heard spectroscopy in biology. It's the whole thing is spectroscopy. Spectra. You can identify molecules, right? All the composition of any substance by spectral lines. And spectral lines tell you, tell you basically how much energy you need to move from one orbit to the next. And every molecule has its own fingerprint or spectral pattern. And that's simply based on quantum mechanics. In other words, we would be nowhere in biology, especially molecular biology, without quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics explains the origin of the spectra. Spectra means <coughs> what frequencies or wavelength or energy, all of it is related, are absorbed if you shine uh, line, light on, on an object, and which ones are emitted if you return them. So fluorescence quenching, all of that stuff you may, may have encountered in your lab, it has to do with this kind of <coughs> simple-minded quantization and becomes more and more complex because, as always, you add electrons complexity, then it's high uh, math to figure out, you know, what frequency corresponds to what. Okay. And, and this is actually uh, a consequence. A, a, a how shall I put it? Um, absolutely unshakable result of quantum mechanics, in, uh, which says the following. It's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, if you accept quantum mechanics, there is this philosophical implication that the universe is unknowable. And even a single particle in the universe cannot be completely understood in terms of its physical position and velocity or properties. So what it says is that delta x and delta p is the um, uncertainty or how precisely you can know the position of something. And delta p is how precisely you can know the momentum or velocity of something. Right? A particle or object or whatever you want. And it says that you cannot simultaneously know the position and velocity to an uh, arbitrary level. There is a ma there is a limit. This, by the way, h is the Planck constant, which I will introduce in a second. That's just a number. And and this is one example. Th there is many examples of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This is a mathematical result which says the following, as, as I explained, but it can be extended. It says that two complementary variables, in quantum mechanics, complementary variables are such that they have special mathematical properties that they don't commute, but position, velocity, energy, and time, two components of spin, uh, two components of angular momentum, uh, they cannot be precisely known simultaneously. Uh, so, that tells you that if you pin down a, part, a, a particle and say, oh, ah, I got you, it's, you're here, then you've lost completely information. So, delta x would be zero, then delta p is infinity, because you divide this by zero, it's infinity. 
So, so if you precisely determine the position of a particle, you have lost completely information about how fast it's moving. And that becomes useless, right? Because if, if you know that the particle, when I did the measurement, was here, but could be as with any velocity from you know, zero to speed of light, then what is it now? I have no clue. That's the limit. The same with, with energy and time. These are also so complementary variables in quantum mechanics. Uh, examples. Position, momentum, energy, and time. Spin components, I'll explain what this, and angular momentum. Energy and time. So again, if you determine the energy of a particle precisely, you have lost complete information about wh when it was that, that the, the particle had that energy, or vice versa. If you found precisely the time, you lost completely information about energy. Spin, uh, naively, but you may have. Um, you know what angular momentum is, right? Angular momentum is if some, an object is moving in a rotational fashion, this is the axis of rotation, this is the uh, mass of this object moving around. So the ang angular momentum, this the radius, um, is um, R times P. Ah, this is L, L. The radius is vector, and the p is momentum, so p is m times v. So angu angular momentum has to do with rotational motion, but it could be three axes of, uh, so there's basically three possible axes of rotation, x, y, z. So an object can rotate around three axes in particular, so if you find angular momentum with respect to one, you cannot find angular momentum with respect to the second. A little bit in intricate. But th this is a uh, very important spin. Spin na naively is understood as ro a rotating particle around its own axis, like an electron. An right? electron would be rotating uh, around its own axis, and you assign this spin value as. Uh, actually, it's, it's a more complicated story, but um, I'll come back to it. I don't want to pile too much on you uh, all at once. Spin is, spin is a quantum mechanical property that doesn't exist in classical world. Um, the importance of spin is that it's been uh, mathematically proven that there is no magnetism, magnetic substances without spin, ferromagnetism in particular. Why is this important? Because one of the critics one of the criticisms of quant quantum biology as a, as a field is that quantum systems are small only, a few particles, a molecule, maybe quantum, but not big like a cell or, or the entire human being cannot be quantum or brain. Well, it's not true because you probably held a, a, a bar, a mag magnetic bar in your hands, you probably played with magnets, uh, play school or elementary school, you play with magnets. These are quantum objects. <laughs> you didn't know it, and you probably heard about it now for the first time, but, but it's true, uh, because spin is a, qu is a quantum f physical property and exists um, mi microscopically. Bar magnets are, you can hold them in your hands, you can see the force, how they repel the two poles of the same type, and so on, but the element elementary magnetic moments are spins. And these spins are only there because of the quantum nature of electrons that are orbiting there. <laughs> so that's why I, I, I put spin there, because it's, um, it's actually a property discovered by um, Wolfgang Pauli in 19, early 1950s. He got a Nobel Prize for it. Mm. Okay, so let's go back to, I, I promised you, I think, five experiments. Very briefly, I'll tell you why these experiments are important. 
At least two of them are important metaphorically for biology today. These five experiments shook the world of physics in, in the 1900s. The first one was so-called black body radiation. That is all objects uh, held at a finite temperature above zero emit radiation. And you can measure the spectrum. That is intensity as a function of frequency. That's called the spectrum. We talked about spectra here, here as well. Very specific spectra of atoms, but there are also spectra of large objects, like a, a brick or, or this table or your face is emitting some radiation even without you knowing that. Okay, so there is a amplitude or intensity as a function of frequency. And these were very well studied. Um, and uh, physicists for decades couldn't solve that, couldn't explain the spectra and um, Max Planck. Max Planck uh, was the person who explained it and introduced the concept of quantization uh, in about, well, 1900 or 1899, maybe it was published in 1900, the paper. Um, and to do it, this is the formula he uh, came up with to fit into this um, spectral line. He introduced a, a constant. It's a, I mean, in physics, when you say curve fitting, it's an insult. In other words, you don't use your brain. You just fit a curve with some algorithm. Let's say do a linear or polynomial or exponential fit, right? But in this particular case, it was curve fitting. <laughs> he got one of the biggest Nobel Prizes in the world. That is for introduction of a completely new concept, quantization. And the, the coefficient, the, the parameter for the curve fitting, h, is the most fundamental constant in the universe, Planck constant. You cannot reduce it to anything else. It is there, it's given, uh, let's put it, you know, um, in quotation marks, God given. That is, we don't know where it came from, but h, Planck constant. Another fundamental constant that you know is the speed of light, c, right? It's also fundamental. We don't know why, but it is what it is. So 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second is the speed of light. Uh, and that's on the same level, a fundamental con physical constant. That's the way our universe is built, <coughs> and that's it. And just as an aside, uh, it's not just an academic question, but you, you may uh, read some, maybe you've read some articles on it, anthropic, anthropic principle. Have you heard about this? Anybody? No? So the anthropic principle states that if we changed, and there's I think five of these fundamental constants, physical constants. One is alpha, uh, it's, it's, it's a fine structure constant, then there is C and there is H, and I remember there's two more. Maybe the, the constant of gravity, I think. Uh, if we changed any of these constants, even by 1%, for some reason we were able to manipulate these fundamental constants, we could never uh, end up with a livable planet Earth. Because there are consequences from the, coming from these constants in terms of the temperature, the, uh, the size of the atmosphere, the expulsion of radiation by the magnetic field around the Earth, and so on and so forth. So you can... Look up this, uh, in Wikipedia I think will give you uh, a pretty good um, description of this anthropic principle. But it's amazing that these constants, although seem to be completely arbitrary like this one, the Planck constant, you know, who would have thought of this as something meaningful? 6.6 .6 to 61 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds. But, but if it was only 5 times 10 to the minus 34th, we couldn't live on this planet. <laughs> Because everything would be completely different, you know, in terms of the energy structure of the, the uh, spectra and the atoms and all that, and 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 how solar energy is is created by the sun and how much energy is coming from the. So, this this anthropic principle uh, t talks about it in a very mm, interesting way. I, uh, there's just no explanation to it. Our universe is built the way it is, but if you try to tweak it, it it'll be maybe not possible for humans to, to exist in it. All right, so Planck's contribution 
to science, twofold. The fundamental constant, Planck constant. Secondly, energy quantization. So what, he's, what he did to explain this is he said that energy, first of all, actually two things in it. Um, this is the Planck formula. Energy is proportional to frequency of electromagnetic radiation. That's, and the constant of proportionality is the Planck constant. So he put this in. Okay, fine. But then he said, by the way, you cannot have an arbitrary um, number of such um, energy units. You, you know, a priori you could say, well, this object has 2.73 HF uh, energy units of quanta. No, it cannot be. It can only be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. up to inf infinity for photons. So n is the number of quanta and it's an integer. And that's why the whole field was coined quantum mechanics as a result of this quantization principle. All right. Um, so that's the, that's the first, um, that's the first building block for quantum mechanics and the first experiment that took a long time to explain and explanation changed the whole view of, of the universe. The second experiment, um, again, paradoxically, both Planck, Planck was initially res reluctant to do it because he, he could not put it in his head that there is some arbitrary quantization principle. So it was, again, curve fitting, an attempt to explain observations without really understanding where it, where it comes from. But now we know, we can actually uh, perfectly mathematically explain all this. I, I have no time for that. But the second experiment was um, the photoelectric effect. And so he, here's the, the effect, it's a, it's a vacuum tube with two electrodes connected to a battery and an ammeter measuring the current and then there's in incoming uh, beam of light and depending on the color of light you either see a current flowing through this circuit or not. If light is red, which means that according to this formula longer wavelength uh, um, higher frequency, lo lower frequency, therefore lower energy, there will be no current because this red light has not enough energy in it to eject an electron from one of these plates. It's the emitter plate. Blue light has more energy in it, sufficiently so to eject an electron fr from the surface of the, of the metal into the vacuum and they'll be attracted to the positive plate and the current will flow. So you close the circuit and you start measuring the current. What's, what's uh, fundamentally new in this is that you have a, an energy gap again. It's a, it has to do with quantum mechanics. So an electron can be in the valence band or be ejected into the conduction but it has to acquire a sufficient amount of energy which confirms Planck's formula. That wasn't known at the time. Uh, just you know, a few years earlier, Planck published a paper, so there was an independent confirmation that energy has to do with frequency times this Planck constant. And so Einstein wrote the paper, explained the photoelectric effect, and in 1905, no, he proposed this in 1905. I don't remember what. 1912 or 13, he got the Nobel Prize a few years later, maybe less than a decade later, for something which was almost like a, uh, a graduate assignment, okay, but compared to, to his later work. Um, it, it's not a big thing. Uh, the photoelectric photo effect itself is a big thing because we use it all the time. You go to the washroom and the lights automatically turn on, it's a photo cell, right? It's exactly how it works. But it's a technological effect, but it's not a fundamental discovery. 
except that it corroborates Planck's <laughs> assertions. Um, as you know, the main contributions of Albert Einstein to physics were special theory of relativity and general theory of relativity, which mean that there is no objective frame of reference, special relativity that time flows at a different rate in moving uh, obje in objects which move at different speeds. And, and then, then the general theory of relativity tells us that the space-time is curved around masses. So it's not like Cartesian coordinate systems but the masses curve the space, so, so it becomes, yeah, very uh, context dependent. Okay, um, this is very interesting, and you, I'll come back to it on Tuesday because the photoelectric effect is is conceptually very similar to photosynthetic effect in biology. Photosynthesis, which means how plants. Uh, generate energy from from light uh, coming from the sun. The sun is the giver of energy to all of us, directly or indirectly. There's no other way, right? Because we, the the food chain starts with the plants, and, and the plants get the energy from the sun, which we animals eat, and we eat animals or not. But but it's very similar to the photoelectric effect because light comes here, ejects electrons. You have electrons that can be used for some chemical reactions in, in, a, in the chlorophyll, and, and, and we'll come discuss it in more detail. And photosynthesis, by the way, is, is, has been demonstrated in the past decade to be a quantum effect. So th this is the important link between physics and biology. In physics, the photoelectric effect explained by Einstein opened the doors to quantum mechanics within the physical context. Photosynthesis is metaphorically similar to it and opens the door to quantum biology. Why is it important? Because, as I said, metabolism, <laughs> what is the difference between living and non-living systems? Energy acquisition, uh, m metabolism and therefore entropy reduction. If that is the most fundamental process in biological systems, and if that process is quantum, then obviously there is something very important to be said about quantum physics in biology, all right? Um, there's also evidence that, uh, that animals, which produce energy differ differently by either glycolysis or oxidative phosphorylation, in oxidative phosphorylation, mitochondria also participate in quantum energy production. So, and I'll show you that on Tuesday next week. Um, so I'm building up a little bit of suspense, but, uh, but the, uh, the importance is that physics without a doubt is based on quantum concepts, without a doubt. Uh, as we go into larger and larger system, uh, our perception of quantum effects diminishes because the distances between discrete energy levels become smaller and smaller. Imagine now that you've built um, a system with a billion energy levels. They become continuous. Just like when you watch TV, you don't perceive the pixels on the TV screen. We create in our brain continuous images. You don't perceive the, the time steps, we don't perceive the grainness of the screen, right? So you think that TV, or, uh, the, the streaming of TV images or images from YouTube or whatever you're watching, you process it in your brain as if it was space and time continuous, right? Unless it's something wrong and you look up really close, you'll see that there are actually little squares there. That is very similar to how we perceive objects which are bigger and bigger, although each element, each atom, each molecule is quantum. The, and we'll come to the um, appreciation of what quantum energy level means mathematically or in terms of numbers. Um, they are te terribly small. 
And if you have billions and trillions of such small units, they become indistinguishable and appear to be continuous. So, in other words, our perception of classical reality is a function of our inability to see quantum. So, uh, th that actually is a separate, um, separate lecture. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not trained to do it, but I think about this a lot. In, in, terms of, in terms of how limited our human brain is in terms of relying on the senses. And our senses span a tiny, tiny uh, segment of the spectrum. The eye, for example, visible spectrum, as you know, it's between 400 and, and uh, 700 nanometers wavelength, right? Yeah. I mean, this is really nothing <laughs> in the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. Our um, sense of hearing uh, relies on 20 to 20,000 hertz, right? Our sense of touch, well, of course, we have to be very close to something. To, to touch and, and, and sense it, and, and the pressures, the forces are also very small. Um, we rely on these things for our understanding of the universe. But the universe is not limited to these frequencies of uh, acoustic or electromagnetic waves. I, I don't know. I, I so I, I wonder if, if it would be useful for me to point out so something that makes this term unique. In this course, we have a midterm exam. We have only one exam. It's February 27th. We've never had these set of lectures before the midterm. So these lectures have never been formally examined before. Also, one week from today, I'm not here. So for your third lecture on the evening, yeah. I'm not here. And I'd like the students to leave that third lecture with some idea of what you're likely to test, what you want uh -huh. them to know, because um, more so than most lectures, these su subjects you're talking about really seem there. there is no bound, right? There is <laughs> no bound. It's boundless. Right? <laughs> yes. But they need some sort of yeah. bounds. So, so in your yeah. third lecture, you should indicate I, I will, and, and, and it'll be descriptive, but I think I, I, I can ask you the following question. Um, um, well, maybe not after this lecture, <laughs> but I, no, I can ask you what, is, what are the main differences between classical and quantum physics? Mm -hmm. List three main differences, for example. Yeah. Something like that. Okay, but so... so uh, Coming back to, 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 to biology and the senses, so, so we are limited by this, but by two things, our senses, and secondly, by intuition. Intuition is built by our experience. And quantum mechanics is something which is completely outside of our intuitive feeling. Uh, everyday experience doesn't deal with quantum uh, processes. Which does not mean uh, that, that quantum physics is irrelevant to biology. And, and one more thing. If plants, and we know that, use quantum physics to extract electromagnetic energy from the rays of sun, they learned that, uh, um, let's say, I don't know, two billion years ago or something. Why would evolution abandon this? Uh, evolution uh, is all about competitive advantage, right? Uh, retaining ad uh, advances in, during the adaptation, improving. So why would plants have an advantage over animals in being able to use quantum physics and animals just kind of lo lost it? I, I doubt it so much. <laughs> and therefore, I'm, I'm very much um, interested in finding examples of, oh yes, of quantum effects in biology and physiology and medicine. We'll talk a little bit about this on Thursday next week. Um, but just to... Uh, to make this connection to oh, olfaction, S sense of smell, I forgot about this one. Our eyesight is incredibly sensitive to a single, to one or two photons. This has been determined experimentally that human eyes can detect a single photon, which is a quantum object, quantum of light. Therefore, 
uh, this sense, which is probably the most important of the senses, is in tune with quantum mechanics. Olfaction as well. Olfaction, sense of smell. We have very acute dogs even more so. Maybe uh, some an other animals. I think dogs, some dogs are incredibly sensitive to smell. And they can detect a single particle uh, with a particular odor. And there is a very recent research showing that olfaction is not based on um, um, structural fit like typical, typical ligand receptor interaction, but vibrational resonance, which is a quantum interaction. So um, I think um, I'm getting a signal that we, I should be call, uh, calling. No, no, no. 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 Okay, all right. So I'll see you on Tuesday, guys. <laughs> right, so let's move on. Uh, these are the other effects which were mm, instrumental in bringing quantum physics uh, into the uh, mainstream uh, about a, a century ago. I mentioned that already. The Compton effect is basically demonstrating that photons act, so light is not just a wave, but can also act as a particle by hitting an el electron and pushing it uh, in a direction given by its momentum. I talked about this, atomic absorption emission spectra, which is basically Niels Bohr theory. Ex Niels Bohr, Danish physicist, explained using this heliocentric system and involving quantum energy levels of electrons and atoms and later on molecules. I talked about this double slit experiments for electrons and, and photons. So electrons scatter like photons, in other words, behave like waves when passing through uh, a double slit. And this one was the confirmation of the existence of spin. Uh, electrons um, in magnetic field gradients, they separated into two groups, depending on their orientation of the spin, spin up or spin down. They were forming two beams. Be beams and um, that was proof positive of the existence of something new, a new property, magnetic spin, um, which is kind of, yeah, complementary to the electric dipole. And now that we have only seven minutes left, <laughs> we'll go through the heavy lifting of, so I think it's maybe for you more forgettable, um, the postulates of quantum mechanics. So after all of this, uh, uh, matured and many more experiments performed and um, explanations provided. Um, these mm, luminaries came up with formalism or formal representation, mathematical representation of quantum physics. In terms of postulates, the first postulate of quantum mechanics says that, and I stated this in maybe not so many words, that every physically realizable state uh, is described in quantum mechanics by a wave function or state function psi. It's a probability distribution, as we'll see in the next postulate. It contains all accessible information about the system. We, we cannot have all information, but some of it is accessible. And it, it, in this form, it is probabilistically um, de uh, described. And um, this is maybe technical, but, but if, if you want to argue with people about quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics is a linear theory. It's not a nonlinear theory. Nonlinear means that, that um, cause and effect is uh, not proportional to e each other. Uh, linear is uh, if cause and effect are proportional. In quantum mechanics, it is linear. That means that if a state if a system is in state psi 1, and that, that's another bizarre thing, if, if this describes one state uh, available to a given system and psi 2 is another state, you can make a linear combination. It's called a linear combination or superposition of these two states. And the sy system can also be in such a state. Now, that leads really to some extraordinary claims. Um, that is, and very important, I don't know <laughs> where to begin, but 
you can think about an electron having spin up or spinning this way, let's say, or spinning that way also uh, in separate experiments. But can you imagine being in both states at the same time? Just like going through two slits, electron can have uh, some uh, part of its state being spin up, some spin up, or being um, par partly inside the well, partly outside the well. So all of this is acceptable if any of the components are, uh, is acceptable individually. In other words, again metaphorically, you can think about yourself as an electron and you can be here and at home at the same time. This is the bizarreness of quantum mechanics. No, sorry, no, no, it cannot, it, it, it doesn't have to be, it can be in one state. Like when we take the chem, the introductory chem courses, yes. and we're learning all of this, yeah. and they teach us how to fill the shells and yes. stuff, they say, like, don't they say that you fill either one? Well, yeah, so, to answer your question, what is that teaching you is to find the ground state, or the lowest energy state. And the lowest energy state is obtained by filling the available states from the bottom to the top. Right? However, uh, a molecule can be in several states at the same time. So it doesn't have to be uh, in the, although this is the most probable in most cases, it, it'll be in the ground state, the lowest energy state, but it can be in excited states uh, at the same time. So. Um, it really depends on the experiment. You know, you can excite the molecule to be in, s in a superposition of several states. And this is not so... Hmm. In quantum mechanics, it's normal. It, sorry, it's, it's just... Uh, yeah. But don't throw away your chemistry books, okay? This is, this is useful as a first approximation to reality. But there can be some more complicated situations where, yeah, you... You, uh, it's called linear superposition. And when you do quantum chemistry later on, uh, then they will actually build these very complicated matrices called Hartree or Hartree-Fock matrices with um, electrons being in, you know, at the same time in 20 different states and so on. So, yes, your question is very good, but as uh, you're on the path to, you know, deeper knowledge. So, um, so that's, that, yeah, that's the, um, I mentioned, psi squared, the probability distribution, again, the metaphor with our society being in some, so each of us is kind of like a con contributing prob uh, element to the probability. Okay, and this is where quantum physics really kicks in. The third postulate is, gives, uh, so it gives you a, prescription of how to solve problems in physics and replaces physical properties or observables. In physics labs you measure the position, velocity, you know, and, and angular momentum and calculate the energy. In quantum mechanics you introduce mathematical objects called operators. In fact they are called Hermitian operators. They have spe special mathematical properties and position is replaced by an operator of position. Momentum is the first derivative of position. And energy is the so-called Hamiltonian. And in, again, also in chem chemistry you'll see it. Um, so the Hamiltonian is an operator uh, describing the energy of the system, total energy. And it's kinetic energy, you may remember again from classical physics p squared divided by 2m, so momentum squared divided by 2m, or mv squared divided by 2, if you remember classical physics, but <laughs> in quantum mechanics, momentum becomes the second derivative of position. Uh, so it's, it's very different. Uh, and there are reasons for it, no time in this <coughs> course, but I encourage you to take quantum physics. Uh, 472, I think. You know, 372 is probably the first one, then 472 and then 572. And finally, right on time, one more minute. The last postulate, the most important, 
is this replaces Newton's equations of motion. It's called the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation. Erwin Schrodinger, the same guy, by the way, who wrote What is Life, he derived the most important equation of all physics, the Schrodinger equation, which you also solve in, qu in quantum chemistry. And what it says is <coughs> that the evolution of the wave function, evolution means time, time derivative. You want to, want, you want to know how the, the probability changes over time, that's, you calculate the derivative. If derivative is zero, it means it's not changing. If it's non-zero, it means it's changing over time. This is the kinetic energy, this is the potential energy, whatever the case may be. The guy did it in two weeks on vacation in Swiss Alps, <laughs> which tells you that we should take some time off sometimes uh, away from the office. Um, and of course, you got Nobel Prize for it. What else? Um, so, so that com concludes the introductory part about what is quantum physics and where it came from and wh what it means and also a little bit of what it may mean for biology. And I also want to say that if it means something for biology, it probably means something for medicine. Although this is, we'll touch base a week from now, uh, especially neuroscience, where people are suspecting that our consciousness is actually, to a large degree, a, a quantum phenomenon. So that's, that's all I have for today. Thanks. Questions, comments, criticism? Will I